Every day on Earth, a little over 100,000 tracked flights end in a safe landing. Even more astounding is the remarkable level of safety in modern aviation. Considering the number of aircraft, flights, crew, and passengers, 2017 was the safest year in aviation history. With only 707 fatalities out of an estimated 50 million total flights that year, with only 11 of them being on scheduled commercial flights, flying is statistically safer than even walking. Of all the phases of flight, landing an aircraft is the most hazardous. Since 1959, nearly half of all fatal incidents occurred during final approach and landing. Landing an aircraft requires a delicate balance of navigating, managing the descent of the aircraft, and maneuvering at low speeds while still maintaining a safe level of lift to stay in the air. Add radio communications, weather, and air traffic to the equation, and it quickly becomes a complex operation. In order to understand how automated landing works, let's take a look at how landing works for all aircraft. Civil aviation is broken down into two sets of operating rules, VFR or visual flight rules and IFR or instrument flight rules. Visual flight rules allow an aircraft to fly solely by reference to outside visual cues such as the horizon, nearby buildings, and terrain features for navigation and orientation. Aircraft separation is also maintained visually. Visual flight rules require VMC or visual meteorological conditions. This is a minimum standard of weather conditions defined by visibility, cloud ceilings, and cloud coverage. Commercial airliners generally operate under instrument flight rules. Instrument flight rules are required in order to operate in weather conditions below VMC, known as IMC or instrument meteorological conditions. Instrument flight rules are also required at altitudes above 18,000 feet where airliners cruise. IFR flights are capable of completing entire flights solely based on instrumentation and require meticulous planning known as a flight plan. They are also tracked and directed by air traffic control along their routes, relying on them to maintain safe separation from other traffic within controlled airspace. The landing phase of an airliner can be broken down into five segments. Arrival, Initial Approach, Intermediate Approach, Final Approach, and Missed Approach. Arrival begins when the aircraft transitions out of the cruising phase of the flight. The protected airspace assigned to the aircraft begins to narrow until it reaches the initial approach. This narrowing typically begins about 25 nautical miles before the start of the initial approach for most major airports. The initial approach segment begins at a point known as an initial approach fix or IAF. Fixes are navigational points that are formed from the intersection of various established aviation radio navigation aids. During the initial approach, the aircraft will maneuver into an appropriate speed and altitude for entering the intermediate approach segment. The initial approach provides at least 1,000 feet of obstacle clearance to the aircraft. The initial approach segment then transitions to the intermediate approach at the intermediate fix or IF. The purpose of the intermediate segment is to get the aircraft configured and ready for final approach. It will usually have a shallow descent gradient and provide at least 500 feet of obstacle clearance. While approach, segments, fixes, and procedures are published for every airport in a document known as an instrument approach procedure chart or approach plate, it's common for air traffic control to manually route or vector a flight to its final approach based on traffic, weather, and airport operational conditions. Final approach is the last leg before a successful landing. It can begin either from a final approach fix or an inbound vector or a procedure turn made at the end of the intermediate segment. It typically begins at a distance of 5 to 10 nautical miles from the runway threshold. If the pilot fails to identify the runway, a missed approach or go around is initiated. This allows the pilot to safely navigate from the missed approach point to a point where they can attempt another approach or continue on to another airport. The final approach of an aircraft can be executed in several ways. If visual meteorological conditions exist and the pilot accepts it, air traffic control may direct a visual final approach. At large airports, this is usually done for efficiency. By allowing aircraft to follow each other in while maintaining a visual separation, incoming traffic is compressed allowing more aircraft to land per hour. An instrument final approach is typically done when visual meteorological conditions aren't met at night or when terrain or air traffic prevents safe visual approaches. Instrument approaches come in two primary types, non-precision and precision. While both types offer lateral navigation, only precision approaches offer vertical guidance known as a glide path. 
One of the most commonly used types of instrument approaches in landing is a precision approach system known as Instrument Landing System or ILS. How ILS functions is key to understanding how automated aircraft landings work. An ILS system is a ground-based navigational aid composed of two subsystems that each transmit a radio signal. When combined, these signals present a path down towards the runway centerline. The first part of ILS is known as its localizer. The localizer is composed of an antenna array normally located beyond the departure end of the runway. It consists of several pairs of directional antennas transmitting at one of 40 ILS radio channels specific to that runway. The antennas left of the runway centerline emit an ILS radio signal with a 90 Hz tone, while those on the right modulate a 150 Hz tone. When an approaching aircraft's ILS receiver tunes to a runway's ILS localizer, the ILS equipment measures the strength of both tones. If one tone is stronger than the other, the aircraft is misaligned to the runway on the stronger tone side. When the strength of both tones match, the aircraft is laterally aligned to the runway. The second component of the ILS is known as its glide slope. This system operates similar to the localizer except in the vertical plane and on a separate radio channel that is matched to the localizer's channel. The glide slope centerline is usually angled about 3 degrees upward from ground level with the 90 Hz tone representing above the glide slope and the 150 Hz tone below it. The angle of the glide slope is chosen so that it crosses the threshold of the runway at a height of 50 feet. While both systems operate independently, the capture and tracking of both signals down to the runway form an ILS runway approach. A key part of an ILS procedure is known as the decision height. The decision height is the altitude in which the pilot must forego ILS guidance and identify a visual reference to the runway in order to complete the landing. If this reference isn't available at the decision height, then a missed approach must be flown. The altitude of the decision height is determined by the category rating of the ILS approach. This rating is dependent upon the ILS equipment on the ground, runway configuration, aircraft capabilities, weather, and air crew certification. Category 1 ILS approaches are the most common types and are available to all ILS capable aircraft, including small single engine planes. The decision height for a Category 1 ILS approach is 200 feet with a minimum runaway visual range or RVR of 1800 to 2600 feet. Because of the high decision height, a standard altimeter that relies on ambient air pressure to determine altitude is used. This is known as mean sea level altitude or MSL. Category 1 ILS approaches offer enough distance from the ground for a single pilot to easily determine a missed approach. Furthermore, if the ILS system fails during the approach, enough time and altitude are available to safely recover and initiate a missed approach. Category 2 and 3 ILS approaches are where the critical use of aircraft automation come into play. They are generally used in poor visibility conditions where the autopilot system is relied upon to land. Known as auto land, this is done because of the low decision heights. Deactivating the autopilot system and asserting manual control with such a low margin of safety can become hazardous. The autopilot system on modern airliners are sophisticated, heavily used systems that can automatically adjust flight control surfaces in order to maintain altitude, turning maneuvers, headings, navigation points, and approaches. They typically couple with an autothrottle system that automates aircraft speed control. Because of the sub-200 feet decision heights, all aircraft certified for Category 2 and 3 approaches have two or three redundant autopilot systems, each with their own independent computers, sensors, receivers, controls, and inertial navigation systems, a gyroscopic device that provides information on the aircraft's orientation. This allows for fast responding to failures within the autopilot system, especially during critical low altitude parts of the approach. In a triple redundancy system, if one of the autopilot computers requests a control input that diverges from the other two, it gets voted out of the autopilot system. The aircrew is alerted and the two remaining autopilot computers continue to operate. If those two diverge at any point, the autopilot will take itself offline and alert the aircrew of a fault. This is known as a fail positive system as it continues to function during a fault. In a double redundancy system, if the two computers diverge in control input, the smaller input is used and then the autopilot system takes itself offline, triggering a fault. This is called a fail passive system. When an autoland procedure is conducted, low visibility procedures are usually in place for the runway, or the request is made for a category 2 or category 3 approach. 
The ILS ground system for both Category 2 and Category 3 approaches are constantly monitored for fault and must be able to switch to backup generators quickly if power is lost. They also require more terrain and ground traffic clearance around the runway as well as larger air traffic separation in order to prevent interference with the ILS signal. As the aircraft enters the final approach, it is configured for landing. Lift modifying devices such as flaps and slats are extended from the wing and configured to produce more lift at lower speeds. The landing gear is also deployed closer to the runway. Because of the close proximity to the ground, the autopilot must use a radar-based altimeter that measures the distance to the ground below. Known as the above ground level or AGL, this is measured by bouncing a radar signal off the ground in order to determine altitude. Air pressure based altimeters are not allowed for category 2 or category 3 operation. Before capturing the ILS signal, the aircrew arms the autopilot system for an auto land approach. This initiates a thorough built in test of all needed aircraft systems. The aircraft may also be pre-trimmed so that the nose points up slightly under no control input. This is done to allow for a safe nose-up recovery if the autopilot fails close to the ground. For an autoland procedure, two pilots are required. One pilot monitors the autopilot system and the landing process, while the second crew member remains at the ready to fly a missed approach in case of a failure or if the landing pilot cannot make visual contact with the runway at the decision height. With Category 2 approaches, the decision height is made between 200 feet and 100 feet. Category 3A approaches can be made below 100 feet, and Category 3B approaches can be made at 50 feet or at the threshold of the runway. If visual contact is made with the runway, the autopilot will begin to throttle back power and begin a pitch-up maneuver known as a flare in order to reduce the energy of the aircraft. This causes the aircraft to stop flying and settle onto the runway. If the approach is declared a missed approach, a go-around mode is activated on the autopilot system, rejecting the autoland procedure. The aircraft automatically throttles back up to fly the missed approach. As the autoland proceeds after touchdown, automatic braking is deployed to slow the aircraft down. The autopilot will still continue to track the localizer and command the rudder in order to keep the plane centered on the runway. As the aircraft slows further, control surfaces start to become ineffective as less air flows over them. At this point, the autopilot system is disabled, and manual ground steering of the aircraft via the nose wheel is done to taxi off the runway. The most hazardous part of an autoland approach is during the flare into rollout transition, as it offers very little margin of time for responding to a failure. Because of this, during autopilot system design, the predicted reliability numbers for the individual equipment which makes up the entire autoland system are combined and an overall probability of failure is assessed. The overall failure probability must be less than 1 in a million in order to certify an aircraft for Autoland. Furthermore, air crews are required to be certified in the procedure in order to employ it, as well as maintain regular practice with its use, making it a safe and reliable procedure overall. Despite the benefits and safety of Autoland, its use is limited when compared to manual landings. This is primarily due to the runway and the traffic separation requirements of Category 2 and 3 approaches which reduce the number of aircraft that can be landed per hour. Equipment and terrain requirements also limit the availability of these approaches on all runways, limiting them primarily to major airports. The future of navigation aids suitable for automated landing lies in Ground-Based Augmentation System, or GBAS. GBAS combines GPS with fixed ground-based reference stations to achieve positional accuracies in the sub-meter range. A single GBAS station could support up to 48 approaches and cover many runway ends, with more installation flexibility than an ILS with localizer and glide slope antennas at each end. GBAS also allows for multiple approaches to reduce wake turbulence dangers, improve equipment resilience, maintenance, and operational reliability. The FAA's Next Generation Air Transportation System Modernization Initiative promotes GBAS as a successor to ILS in order to increase safety airport capacity, and lower noise and weather delays.